Christmas season. Christmas season can feel like a season that's out of control. It can feel so cluttered with so much. It's the hustle, it's the bustle. Sure, we love the lights, we love the decorations, and we love all the sights and the smells, but here's a better question at Christmas. Do you hear what I hear, or do you see what I see? So we get so caught up in everything that's around us. We get so caught up in trying to make Christmas happen. There's so much involved in trying to make everybody happy and everything perfect and getting everything just right so that we can, we can really do Christmas. But we don't celebrate Christmas because of everything that, that, that is around us. We celebrate Christmas because something happened. But sometimes we miss out on what happened because there's not enough space to take it in. That in the busyness and the hustle and the craziness of the season and the overwhelming feelings of emotions that come along with Christmas, there's just simply not enough space to simply breathe in and understand Christmas for what it really is. But what if Christmas could be different? What if we could choose different this Christmas? What if we could pause long enough to answer the question, what is it that you hear? And what is it that you see going on in your life that maybe is hindering or blocking you from experiencing the fullness of this Christmas season? See, sometimes what we have to be willing to do is we have to be willing to clear the clutter and we have to be willing to cut the noise. We, ha we have to be willing to just tune out some of the things that are trying to distract us from the main thing that can actually have a life-giving impact on us. Do you hear what I hear? Do you see what I see? Can you hear that? When you begin to cut out the noise? When you begin to cut out the noise, you can begin to enjoy the silence. The silence that says, I can sit in this moment and I can experience the significance of what Christmas really is and what Christmas really means as we choose to simply make room. We've been um, married for 11 years, and um, in the last probably six or seven years, we've been trying to have kids. And um, at 2018, we realized, like as it came to a close, that that probably was not going to happen for us, like biologically. So um, we started making an interesting emotional transition. I think we pray when times were tough. Yeah. You know, like like oh, if you just help me through this, I promise I won't ever. Or if you just fix Not this, we that. promise that we agree <laughs> that we won't, you know, like we won't get mad over every little thing or we, you know. I mean, we've been through so much, like we've been through so much. And I just felt like God wasn't and never paying attention to me for some reason. Or I feel like, why should I just go to God? I mean, he has so much on his plate. I felt like something was missing, you know, and then, we made the decision that we need to, to find something. And it wasn't, it wasn't, let's go find God or let's go find our faith. We, something was missing. And, you know, she always grew up, Desiree always grew up in a Christian home. So I felt like, okay, why are we not, you know, searching for fulfillment in that area? After my experience of like going to church to church is like, like church isn't for me but like like after you know getting like to know the people and the community and city line is like you know you feel welcome and like you know you could call this like a second home i think moving into a next stage of life where we've kind of given up okay we're probably not going to have biological kids and who knows what the future holds you know it's a new way to trust him um i mean People that I know that have little kids have to trust him every day to just survive, you know? So I think either way. <laughs> but for us, like not really knowing what it would look like is it gives us opportunities to trust him 
in a new way and not just trust him like, okay, now I have more faith, but like actually to, in, in the moment of pain, in the moment of fear, knowing that he like is there and, and can bring me comfort in the moment. So there's so many emotions that come with an intensity of a season like Christmas. But I think the resounding question is, do you see what I see and do you hear what I hear? It's more than just a popular song. It's not just one of our Christmas favorites, but actually it's a, it's a question that, that actually demands answers. It's actually a question that I want us to kind of look at today because the reality for you and I is at some point we're going to have to choose what we're going to give attention to. We'll have to choose what we actually pay attention to as it relates to our life. But before we dive into that, let me just start by just saying, hey, uh, Merry Christmas. All right, Merry Christmas, good stuff. We pray that you guys are having a good time so far here at City Line. And if I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Jack. I get to be one of the pastors here. And we're thrilled that you chose to spend time with us this weekend. Uh, if you're following along, maybe online at our Facebook Live or our live feed, we love you. We're thankful for you and glad that you're a part of our community of faith as well, but it is Christmas season, and, and there's, it's the, for us, we, we, we always say this all the time, it's, it's kind of the most wonderful time of year, there's a lot of celebration and excitement for us as a church, uh, but, but Christmas is an interesting time of year as well, because many of you, whether you consider yourself religious, or a church person, or a non-church person, or, or, or maybe you're actively following Jesus, uh, whether you were a willing participant in coming today, or whether someone dragged you, and this is your early Christmas present to them, the reality is, is that all of you, you come with a certain expectation about hearing uh, the Christmas story, right? You come with an expectation uh, with what your ideas of what Christmas might be all about. And so you kind of have an idea or know what I'm going to talk about, which kind of makes it interesting for me. Because it's like, how do I take a different direction? How do I kind of maybe tell you something that you feel that you don't already know? But let me just kind of ask you to kind of track with me for the next few moments together. I, I think that maybe we'll discover that there's some things about the Christmas story that we might not always see at first glance, that we've become so accustomed to, so used to. It's just become the norm for us that we might miss out on the significance of this season. So I'm going to ask you to, to lean in, which is going to require a fair amount of focus, let's be honest. But in a season like Christmas, focus is so hard, right? It's like, I mean, there's stuff twinkling places you know what I mean? There, there, there's stuff calling your attention everywhere. There, there's, the, there's all the shopping you still have yet to do, right? I'm going to be with you on the 24th, right? You know, the 24th, we don't start church until 7 p.m. that night, right? You know where I'm going to be? Hustling right next to you, right? Standing in long lines. Why? Because there's all these things that are distracting us from what we need to really focus on. But as we focus on, on Christmas, one of the things that I love about Christmas is just kind of the stuff that kind of comes around Christmas. I, I love it that Christmas uh, brings everybody kind of to the table of taking incredible family pictures. You ever tried that? right? You know, some of you, you go way out of your way and you actually get a legitimate photographer. You go on location. You're all wearing the matching outfits, right? You know, and, I mean, it looks legit. You know what I'm saying? When I get those Christmas cards in the mail, I'm just like, this is amazing. You know what I mean? Others of you, this is the best you're going to look for the remainder of this year. And so today's your day, right? Today is like family picture day because you know that when you leave this place, you at least got to get a family Christmas picture. But people are just so creative with their family pictures. In fact, there's one that I found, um, it wasn't sent to me, but I found this one, and I thought it was awesome, wanted to share. Check this out. Maybe Christmas kind of feels like this, right? We're excited, we're engaged, we're expecting, and then Emily, you know what I'm saying? It's just like, I, I, I mean, uh, maybe, maybe you've been there, right? Like everybody's celebrating something in their life. Everybody's excited about something in their life. Everybody's got something that's happened this year, and you're like, and I'm just still here. You know what I mean? It's, like, it's, one, of, it's one of those, those weird feelings. It's, it's not just that, but I, I love the fact that um, it's not just family pictures, but I learned yesterday by, by stepping foot into a mall, Santa's kind of a really big deal. You know what I mean? Uh, people will go way out of their way to take pictures with Santa. We actually tried it one time early on in our family history. Check this one out. Yeah, this is kind of like the early years, you know what I'm saying? This is before our family was fully complete, you know? But I love it that we've got Santa Claus and we got all of us. We're just having the time of our life, with the exception of my daughter. You know what I mean? She's just kind of like, uh, yeah, this Santa? No, uh, uh I got my eye on you, right? Don't try anything funny. And I love it. One of my, one of my favorite all-time pictures. And it's not just family pictures. It's the gifts, right? We love, we love gifts every time of the year, you know, any time of the year for me, you know what I mean? But especially at Christmas time. And so... 
but sometimes gifts just don't, they just, I don't know, they just kind of miss the mark a little bit. So I found this one. Um, this is early Jack. You know what I'm saying? This is uh, still got hair trouble there too. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm not sure what the straight line right across, you know, it's like the the bowl cut thing, you know what it's like? I, I, I don't know. But, but I remember asking for like a Pac-Man game and I got a watch that you can kind of play Pac-Man on, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so it's one of those things that, you, you know, you can tell by the look on my face, like this is kind of what I asked for, <laughs> but not really what I asked for, right? You know, we all have those gifts where they kind of, they, they, they all, almost got there, you know what I'm saying? But for whatever reason, it's just not quite the thing, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you, you didn't, you know, well, I'll say it for another time, but, but you know, my mom's probably watching, mom, I love you, I still, I appreciate it, okay? I still, I still, I still love it, right? But, but it's, it's, it's so, it's so good, right? But, but perhaps like this time of year, more than any other time of year, I mean, just this year especially, I think there's just two great things about this time of year, and we have a picture with both of them together, it's so awesome, and maybe you can agree with this, it must make Christmas wonderful. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about like, I mean. I mean, Jesus is always so handsome and Yoda's just so cute. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, there's so much wrong about this picture, people. You know what I'm saying? But the reality is somebody seen fit on the internet to put it together and I could not resist. You know what I mean? Because... It's great. But, but think about this for a second. I mean, I get it. You, you've heard the Christmas story so many times, right? You've heard, you've heard the bits and pieces of the story for so many times. And for most of us, the Christmas story is kind of this religious, kind of even sort of predictable story that we kind of tell during this time every single year. But you might be surprised to know that the first century audience who, who would have experienced this, this actual Christmas event, they would have thought the furthest thing from it being religious or predictable. In fact, they they would have seen it more as something that was a bit scandalous, something a bit out of control, seemingly chaotic, doesn't even make sense. How do we even fathom what's going on in this moment? So I want us to kind of break that down and just kind of think of what you may know of the story, but also think maybe there's more to this story. For most of us, the story kind of looks like this in our mind. It's the nativity right? We, we, we have all the pieces together, right? As long as nobody broke them, you know? And, and, and it all fits together. One of my fondest memories growing up is, is the nativity set that my mom used to have in the house. And, and it was one that I just, I always loved when she put it out. And everybody's present. You've got, you've got the wise men, you've got the shepherds, you've got Mary and Joseph, there's an angel. Usually they have a star, you know? It's fascinating. Some of us, this isn't good enough for us, right? This, we know is kind of messy. It's in a barn. It's in a stable. So what we try to do with our Christmas story is we try our best to modernize our Christmas story, to, to make our Christmas story just a, a little nicer to take, kind of like, like the millennial Christmas story, like this, right? Like, if you've never seen this, like, you're missing out, okay? This is like the millennial nativity, okay? It comes fully equipped, right, with Mary and Joseph taking a selfie, because why not? You've got a cow eating gluten-free feed because that's what you do, right? You've got the three wise men who have showed up, right, on segways, mind you, okay, bringing their Amazon gift packages to your house, okay? I mean, think about this for a second. I mean, what a great picture. I mean, so much wrong about that picture as well, but it's kind of humorous, especially when you got solar panels on your manger. <laughs> Sometimes we can have fun with the Christmas story, but even in the fun of the Christmas story, we miss out on the significance of the Christmas story. See, Christmas was a lot more like what we originally remember Christmas being, that original nativity. But even in this original nativity, some of us take that at face value and think, well, that, that's, that's just how it is. That's just how it is. I mean, think about it. You know, you, you've, got, you've got Mary and Joseph, and they're there. But, but you know, if that baby was that young, and those of you that are parents, you never look that happy. You never, you never look that happy. 
most have an angel that's somehow in the manger, hovering over the manger, standing by the manger. But the reality is, is when you read scripture, it says that the angel showed up to Mary first before she ever ha- gave birth, that, that, that an angel showed up to Joseph to encourage Joseph in this journey. And then angels, actually a bunch of angels, showed up to shepherds in the field, but never do you really have an angel waiting by the manger, keeping watch. But we assume that that's what happened. We assume that that's the way that it goes. The wise men, the wise men came bearing gifts from afar. Three wise men, mind you. Why? Because gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But I might want to add in there that we don't really know if there was three, seven, or 17 wise men. There could have been more, but we seem content with putting in three because, well, there's three gifts. We got to have at least three people to hold them. Sometimes when we look at this, right, we've got wild animals humbly kneeling, right? I don't know if, you're, if it's just me. I just don't buy it, right? Like, like I've been around cows. You know what I mean? Like, cows are not humble, okay? Like, sheep make lots of noise, right? I mean, everybody seems cool, calm, and collective. And perhaps, perhaps, again, just me, the biggest thing, right? If this actually took place, right, in a Middle Eastern, like, Jewish society, okay, I would just think that the rest of them would have just as good a tan as the other guy in the picture, (laughs) right? Think about it right? Nothing seems to make sense, but yet we take it for face value. And because we take it for face value, or we just go through the motions of Christmas, we miss out sometimes on the significance of what Christmas really is. There's a lot of information that we have about this life of Jesus, not just bits and pieces of information, but we have four well-documented accounts of the life of Jesus. Matthew and Luke give us the best understanding of this birth narrative, of what we celebrate this weekend and moving forward into next week. They begin to detail with understanding. Matthew given genealogy. Matthew's helping us to understand that Jesus came from a, a family lineage. Luke giving us all these details because Luke wasn't just gonna take the story at face value. No, no, no. Luke said, I'm going going to investigate the accounts of this. I'm going to go talk to people. I'm going to get key eyewitnesses. I wasn't physically there, but I need to write this down. I've heard so much of this Jesus. I've heard so much of this day that changed history forever. I'm going to write it down so that we could know, he says in his own words, with certainty. Why? Well, because he has evidence. There's certainty in this story. But what fascinates me about Luke's story, because I'll be honest, when I'm reading the Christmas story, Luke chapter two, that's my go-to, right? Like Luke chapter two, that's my favorite one. Luke chapter two, that's the one that my mom reads every Christmas and she cries, okay? It's just, it's just a tradition. Luke chapter two, listen to what it says, okay? And this gets me every single time. It says in Luke chapter two, starting in verse one, about the time Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire, there, this was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth to Bethlehem in Judea, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth birth and she gave birth to a son her firstborn and she wrapped him in a blanket and she laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the hostel now think about this for a second we know enough of the story probably even if you wouldn't consider yourself a religious person or you're here and you're skeptical about this whole jesus stuff you know enough of the story that says you guys are celebrating the fact that the Messiah came, that, that, that God came to be with us, that, that, that God, it's Jesus, it's like God in a bod, you know what I'm saying? Like he's, he's with us, he's, he's in the manger, God, he moves in to your neighborhood. I, I get it, I understand that, but let me just say, if he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, I mean, that's a weird entrance, right? Think about it. He's got a, he's in this hometown where his parents are, his parents go to their hometown, and then suddenly Mary is apparently very pregnant, and the story starts getting complicated from there, and we don't understand, what, how does this happen? How does, how does Jesus, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, suddenly wrapped in cloth and laid in a feeding trough? Doesn't make any sense to us until you read Luke's account, and it says, because there was no room for Jesus. 
that apparently there was, there was no room. Apparently the city was so packed. Apparently things were so crowded. Apparently there was so much going on with this census that they would have tried to go to a home of the, of the closest relative or family member. But when they get there, the keeper of that home simply responds, hey, sorry, sorry, there's not enough room here. Hey, sorry, I, I, don't, have, I don't have room for you in this house. The house is, is packed, but, but I do have a place. I do have a place. If, if you're willing, I mean, it's all we got, but go ahead. You can hang out with the animals. There's a feeding trough. Make yourself cozy on the hay, right? That, that, that's enough. It's, it's, if as like suddenly the innkeeper says, I don't have room for you, but I will give you a place to which I would want to suggest there's a huge difference between room and place. I want you to deposit that thought just for a second, and then let's go back into the story because this story is fascinating. People have been waiting 100 years, hundreds of years for this promised Messiah, but no one has heard from God, and apparently over 400 years, God has chosen to be silent. And then out of nowhere, we read accounts of angels showing up with a message to a teenage girl at a time in history where a girl, let alone a teenage girl, had no voice had no, no ranking, wouldn't have been considered a credible witness to anything. This angel shows up and speaks of this unlikely pregnancy. It's gonna be a non-traditional pregnancy in that the Holy Spirit, God is up to something. God is going to be the person that does this, that it's God doing something in your life to which Mary doesn't quite understand, but yet we learn it happens. Mary becomes pregnant. Now it's a teen pregnancy. It's outside of marriage and all the social stigma that would have been attached to her and her family as everybody in the surrounding community scratched their heads with amazement uh, at the likely story. Oh, so no, yeah, you weren't doing anything wrong, Mary. You were just minding your own business, right? Mm-hmm, um, that's a good one. I'm gonna try that one too, right? All the social stigma that would have went around this the entire time, yet the whole time people knowing that she's engaged. So it's like, what's up? Were you and Joseph doing something? And it wasn't true because apparently it's documented that Joseph gets this terrible news that suddenly he learns that the woman that he's engaged to is, is going, going to give birth. She's pregnant. Like, I mean, how does that, I mean, I, I'm so many questions he must have in that moment though. He begins to think that maybe, maybe, maybe I shouldn't marry this woman. They're forced in the last stages though, we learn in, in this pregnancy to travel between a, an 80 to 120 miles to take this census. And most would consider that, oh, pregnant Mary, well, of course, she was on a donkey, wasn't she? Nowhere in scripture does it say that she was. But we just assume that that's what happened. It could have happened that way, but my guess is they did their best to walk this journey just like most people did. They might have hitched a ride, we don't know, but they made the effort and journey late in this pregnancy to show up for this census. But they apparently didn't call ahead they apparently didn't schedule a room in advance. There is no VRBO. There is no Airbnb. There is none of that at this point. There's just the reality of when they show up to a place where they think they're going to be accepted, where room would be created, suddenly they learn there's no room. There's no room. I find that, I find that fascinating. There, there's no vacancy. Everything is, is, is occupied. I, I have the tendency to, to take scripture and, and, and try to, link that up with our life, to, to not just take it for this story that doesn't have any kind of connection, but I take scripture and it's specifically this Christmas story, this nativity that we know so well, and I have to place myself in it and I have to ask myself the question, could it be that sometimes Jesus shows up to the very place in which he thinks that he would be most accepted into our own life, into our very lives, right? To invade our life. But yet when Jesus shows up, we often hang the tag, no room, no room, occupied, no vacancy. Why do we do that? Because we understand crowded especially this time of year. We know how to live a crowded existence. We know how to live a crowded life. And what's so amazing to me is we talk about this idea of crowded all the time because we say things like, I can't take another long line. I just can't take another disappointment. I just can't add any more to my plate. And we're constantly looking for something or someone to try to appease us, to bring peace, to bring joy, to bring hope in the middle of our desperation, living so, so crowded. 
Guess what? When we're living crowded, that should actually mean that we've had more stuff than we've ever had before in our lifetime. Yet only to be reminded that it doesn't matter how much stuff you've had, you can have as much stuff as you want because the reality behind you and me is that many times we feel never more empty than we ever have before. Why? Maybe there's just no room. Maybe there's just, there's absolutely no room. There's just, there's just no room for anything else, let alone God, this Christmas story, this, this, this Jesus who would, who, would, who would invade our lives. Our heart is so crowded. Have you ever thought about that? What is it that actually crowds your heart that inhibits you from receiving God's best for you? Ever thought about that? You ever thought about, could there be some obstacles and some barriers that exist that are in the way from you experiencing all that God has intended or maybe all that God has for you? Could you be here today and you're trying your best to listen to me, but at, at the same time, there's all these distractions of where you have to be later today, of all the Christmas parties you still haven't gone to, of all the Christmas shopping that still needs to be done, and whatever you put to cook before you left, hoping you get back in time so it doesn't burn anything down. There's all these things that are crowding our life and we know that all too well to where if we're not careful, there becomes roadblocks. What kind of roadblocks am I talking about? I wanna talk about four quick roadblocks and you might wanna just think about this. I think the first is hurry. We live our life at a hurried pace. And understand me when I say hurry. Hurry goes beyond busy. I, I got news for all of us, we're all busy. Everybody would consider that they're busy. They're busy doing all the things that they think they need to do. They're busy working. They're busy earning a living. They're busy doing school. They're busy, busy, busy. They're busy hanging out with people. They're busy spending intentional time doing, and you can name all kinds of stuff. We're all busy. But what I'm saying is that there's a difference between busy and hurry. We live a hurried existence. And what you have to understand about hurry is hurry is an inner condition of the soul. It affects our heart. It crowds things out. It pushes things away. The reality behind hurry is that we become so consumed with ourselves and our life that we're unable to be fully present with God, let alone anybody else in our life. We become so consumed with everything that we want to do. So what we do is all we do is we just, we, we give place, but we don't give any room. We give place, but we don't, we don't give any room. Another one, if, if you're not the hurry person, you think, oh, I, I live my life at a nice steady pace. Uh, here's what I know for all of us, we have the tendency to worry. If it's not hurry, it's worry. We worry about everything. We worry about stuff. We worry about the outcomes. We worry about the future. We worry about our family. We worry about that sick loved one. We worry about our relationship. We're so worried about our relationship, but we're too busy living hurried to fix it. <laughs> But we're living worried. We're living worried over. And worry isn't the result of your problems. Worry is the result of you thinking that you can fix all of them. <laughs> thinking that you can make it happen. Thinking that, that, that you can figure it out. But you end up knowing at the end of the day that worry is just simply wasted energy. Jesus even says, hey, can you add anything to your life by worry? To which he didn't wait for your response. He's like, nope. <laughs> no. No, you can't. you can't, you can't add anything to your life from worry, but we hurry and, and we worry. And then many of us, we have this tendency, it's crazy, this tendency towards control. We like to control things. And I, I love talking about control in church because if you ever wanna see people squirm, right? I mean, we don't gotta talk about like things like sin. Yeah, we do. But, we, but, we don't, but you could just say control and then suddenly everybody's like, uh, okay, what time is this over? You know, like, because we all deal with control. We all battle wanting to control things, wanting things to turn out just how we want them, just the way we like them, just how it's supposed to work. Our family's supposed to function a certain way. You know, our relationship's supposed to function a, a certain way. We want to put everything in a fine working order, and we have an expectation of how everything is supposed to turn out. And man, when it doesn't happen, we're going to do whatever we can to try to hold on to that, right? We want God to work in our lives. We ask God to work in our lives, but yet we end up resuming control. I read something earlier this this week that says, you know what? If you actually want God to open up doors in your life, then you should consider taking your hand off the doorknob. It's an idea of control. We keep control over this over and over again, but control is an illusion because none of us have it. 
No matter how hard you try, control is, is an absolutely an illusion. But here's what I know when it comes to control. You don't always have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. You don't always have the power to control, but you always have the power to surrender. But let's be honest, when we try to control things enough and it doesn't go our way, you know the other blockage to, to experiencing God's best for us, especially at a season like Christmas, it's just frustration. We're just so frustrated. You didn't get the gift for that person that you wanted to get. You know, like, like you, maybe you got the gift, but you know it's going to show up late. Amazon lied. You said for sure it's gonna be here by the 24th. You were like, sweet. And then you got that email two days later, said mm, more like the 27th, right? Like, you know that and you're so frustrated, right? You get frustrated about things in your life, especially when they don't go the way that you want them to go. And then you try to make it all spiritual. You're like, you know, looking at your life like, yeah, turn to the book of First Irritations, chapter two. And let me tell you a little bit about what's going on in my life. And it's like, no, like, hold up, time out. Could it be the things that you're angry and frustrated with are a result of you just trying to hurry, trying to worry, or trying to resume control over things that you do not have control of? And because you do not have control of them, you're frustrated. And if your frustration isn't checked, then your frustration turns into anger. You're so angry that it didn't work out like you thought. You're so angry that things didn't happen like you wanted them to. You're so angry you didn't get into the school that you wanted to. You're so angry that the relationship didn't work out. And that anger just kind of festers when you don't do anything about it. And it turns into resentment and resentment grows up and gets big and ugly and turns into bitterness. And bitterness consumes our heart and bitterness pushes everything out to where we just hang a no vacancy sign and we say, no room here. No room, there's, there's, just, there's just no, no room. I wonder, I wonder what's in the way of our lives this season that we continue to just say no room. And don't get me wrong, there's a difference between place and room because understand this, right? Like the innkeeper, I mean, think about this. He, he gave place, right? Like this gift comes, like God comes to us in the form of a gift and he gives them places. I'm not gonna make room for you here. It's too crowded here. There, there's no room for you here, but there's a place that like, you, you can go with the animals. I mean, you'll still be close to the rest of us. You'll still be close to your family, right? I wonder if sometimes that's the way that we have our relationship with God. We don't actually open up our lives, open up our heart to give God room, the room that he deserves, the room that he, he came for. The room, he, we don't give him room, but we give him place. We keep him just close enough. We, we, it's a circumstantial thing with God, right? Because we know that when things get hard and things get tough and things get difficult, oh, we're going to say some prayers, and that's when we want God to act. And that's when we got, want God to move. But outside of that, I got this, God. But God, stay close enough just in case things get crazy. We want to give God a certain place in our life. We, we want to have a loose connection with God. We want to come to church maybe on Christmas because we know that especially at Christmas and Easter, we should go to church. And so we keep God just close enough to make us feel good about ourselves. We give him sort of a place, but God, God is asking us to make him room. Make him room. I love the song that we sang. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart do what? Prepare him room. So you act like you didn't know that song now. That's funny. That's funny, right? Because that's what we do, right? Like we, we sing Christmas songs and we only know the chorus and then we kind of hum the verses. But this one is so good. You have to understand. Let every heart prepare him room. Why would we need to prepare him room? Because there's so many things that stand in the way of you and I experiencing the fullness of God's love, the fullness of God's hope, the fullness of God's peace, the fullness of all that God wants to do in and through our life simply because we're not willing to make room. And my guess is this Christmas, God is inviting you to make room. It's the very same thing that he invited Mary and Joseph and others to do. Oh, what do you mean? Yeah, um, have you ever thought about like, I wonder, I wonder if Mary and Joseph only just gave God place instead of giving room? Like, do you ever think back like, man, like we don't know anything else about the innkeeper. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like later, like Jesus was born in my barn. Like, 
Had I known, of course we would have made room. You know what I'm saying? Like, I would have kicked Aunt Mary out. You know what I'm saying? Uncle Jojo, you know, you guys got to go. You know what I'm saying? Like, Jesus is about to be born. Like the Messiah. We don't know that. We don't know if he left disappointed. We don't know if he left frustrated. We don't know anything about him. We don't know about those that didn't make room. We actually have documentation of those who did. Like Mary. I mean, think about this for a second. What would it take for us to make room in our life? I want to suggest maybe it would take paying attention like Mary. You can imagine Mary, right? Like, like Mary's like doing her thing. Like, like Mary, Mary, Mary's just being Mary. Mary is planning to get wedding. Like there's a lot of wet wedding prep going on. There's lots of food that they still got to sample. You know what I'm saying? And, and you know, like the angel shows up. She's like, well, hold up, time out. I, I don't know if you know this or not, but like me and my girls, like we're, we're, we're going on a bachelor getaway, a bachelorette getaway. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we got Palm Springs next weekend. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody got time to be pregnant in Palm Springs. You know what I mean? Like, come on. Like, I, I mean, you know, I'm getting married, right? No, an angel shows up to Mary and Mary is startled and afraid but the angel shows up and says something significant don't be afraid Mary don't be afraid why don't be afraid because God wants to do something incredible in your life God wants to do something incredible in your life the angel goes on and explains, you're going to be pregnant with a child. You're going to give birth to this child. You're going to call him Jesus, to which Mary responds with the only logical question that I think you could ask in that moment, where she says, how's this going to be? Because she knows herself. She knows she hasn't done anything to, to deserve a pregnancy. I mean, what, 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 how's this going to be? Don't be afraid, Mary. God's at work in your life. God wants to do something incredible in your life. And I love Mary's response as she makes room. She says, I am the Lord's servant in Luke chapter one, verse 38. Mary answered, you, let your word be fulfilled. It wasn't, I'm just gonna give you place over here and see what happens. No, I'm gonna clear out my plans, my wedding plans, my bachelorette plans. I'm gonna clear out all those things. And God, you wanna do something incredible in my life? Okay, then I'm gonna make room for you. I'm going to put you at, at the center of my life. I'm going to put you first in my life as I make room. I'm going to pay attention to what you're doing in my life. Maybe getting rid of some of those roadblocks just to start by paying attention. Maybe the second thing would be this. Maybe we just got to be active in removing all the distractions out of our life. All those things that are fighting for our attention, removing us oh, further and further away from what God has for us. Can you imagine Joseph in this moment? I mean, Matthew talks a lot about Joseph and, and Joseph's frustrations and the things that Joseph was working with. I mean, think about Joseph. He's working hard, right? He's preparing for a wedding too. And how many of you know, when, you, when you're a guy and you're preparing for a wedding, most of you, you're like, you got one job, right? Like get all your guys together, get the tuxedos rented, right? You know, like just get it done, right? Women stay on you for a, a long time until it's done, right? You just got that one job, just do your job right? And so he's thinking about, I got one job to do. I got to figure this out. I got to get the tuxes, right? And so he's working through this and all of a sudden he gets devastating news. He gets devastating news that the woman that he's engaged to is now pregnant and he can't figure out how does this happen because he knows it's not his. He knows that he didn't do this. this has, I mean, he didn't have no part in that, but we learn that Joseph is a really good guy. Like Joseph is a nice guy. So because he actually loves Mary and he doesn't want to shame her, he says, look, I get it. You know, I'm going to have to change my Facebook status now for sure. But you know what? I'm not going to post on my wall about my disappointment. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just going to keep that to myself. In fact, I'm just going to quietly just kind of sneak off. Like when she goes to Palm Springs with the girls, you know what I'm saying? Like when she gets back, I'll be out. You know what I mean? Like I'm not, I'm just going to leave quietly so that she's not shamed and disgraced. See, I think he knew everything that she was getting ready to go through and he was wasn't sure that he was ready to do that. But, but in his turmoil, in his chaos, in the crowdedness, God shows up by way of an angel. And you know what the angel says to Joseph? The angel says to Joseph, hey, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Joseph, to take Mary to be your wife. Why? Because God is at work. God is doing something. If you would just be open to it, if you would just trust him, just know that he's at work doing something incredible and you get to be a part of it. So don't be afraid. I can imagine all the distractions that he had to put out of his mind and out of his head just so he can sit in the moment, no longer living in fear. And then the shepherds, right? The shepherds were keeping watch by their flock by night. But what we learn from these shepherds that tell this amazing story is that for us to remove some of these roadblocks, it means us placing a priority on God's presence. 
Us choosing to place a priority and being in the presence of God. To make room for God is to be in the presence of God, to allow God to work and move in and through our life. I love that the shepherds are out in the fields. They're keeping watch over their flock by night. They're, they're at work. They're working. They got a job to do. They're making that money, right? They've been out tonight. They've been watching the sheep. And then suddenly a whole host of angels show up singing God, singing praises to God, saying God has done something amazing. And I don't know about you, but if you were at work like sometime this week and a group of angels showed up, I'd be scared. I'd be nervous. But do you know what they said? They said the very same thing that they said to Mary and Joseph. Listen, you don't have to be afraid. God is at work. In fact, God is doing something amazing. In fact, what God has done tonight through the birth of Jesus, we've come to tell you that it is good news of great joy for all people, not just some people, not just those people, but for all people that we can now have the opportunity to clear the clutter, remove the noise, and make room for the presence of a Savior. Savior. How many of you know that that's that's really what our, our issue is? It's a trust issue because we live our lives in so much fear of things not working out like we want them to, how they should, how we hope that they would. We live in all this fear. That's why we hurry. That's why we worry. That's why we control. That's why we get so mad. And Jesus all the while saying, hey, I've come to do something incredible in your life. You can trust me. You can trust me. All the things that you think you need and all the things that you think you want. I love that Jesus sees beyond the need. He sees past the need. He goes beyond that and he gives you what you really need. Not just what you thought you wanted. He gives you a savior. A savior to rescue you from the hurry and the worry and the control and the frustration and the fear. But it only happens when you choose to make room. I believe this story to be absolutely true, but you don't have to take my word for it. I believe this story to be absolutely true because I've seen the evidence of what God can do when I choose to make room for him in my life. I go beyond just giving place, but I choose to make room, but I don't want you to just take my word for it because there's others that are experiencing it right in front of us. Check this out. Once we started following um following God and having him in our, our everyday lives of uh, us being committed to him, I think that's when things changed for us. I think we surrendered to him and er, our whole lives, everything we, I mean, thank God, he just totally, things started falling into place for us. I, I think We had a lot of things going on mm-hmm. and, and we were just for many years always, and I'm just talking, I guess, business wise. No, right? I think and, I. And personally. Yeah. Because everything just started, we started getting along a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I, you know. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but I know before when we lost something or when something was something was taken from us, we didn't understand why. Oh, yeah, we were why always, like, devastated, we so why, disappointed. You know, when, just so, yeah. When something was supposed to happen and it didn't happen, we. we, we always questioned why and now mm-hmm. I think instead of questioning why is we understand that God had a, a better a plan. better plan yeah. like something better was happening so yeah like I can say I just, I just have felt God's love in all senses more than anything in these past 11 months yeah I like I speak to him and I see him I see him responding back in so many ways that before I've never seen it like I've never seen it and it just feels so amazing. It just feels like, wow, he does love me and he does hear me. There, there is a peace that comes with, you know, seeking God first and then dealing with whatever it is. And when you deal with it, it's not going to be perfect. And it doesn't mean, you know, um, you know, you're doing the, you know, you know, you're not this perfect Christian as you're working through it, you know. You're, you're dealing with real emotions, real emotions when you're dealing with real issues like that, but mm-hmm. just making sure you're, you know, you're, you're keeping that part of, you're keeping, um, you know, God first and then mm-hmm. moving forward through the other stuff. That's where making room for him, I think, comes in because our minds can be filled with worry and, and um and stress and all of these little details of things that need to get done, even in even in things that we're grateful for, you know, like our minds can still be filled with the details and the stress of how to get things done. Um, and and making room for him means that we're like remembering his goodness, his the peace that he brings, the joy that he brings, and like 
the hope, especially at Christmas, right? Like the hope that he's brought into this season, like it's a reminder um, that God is here with us. And so we make room for him by acknowledging that and then inviting him to like, maybe crowd out the worry sometimes, you know, like with the hope that he brings us. One of the biggest misconceptions about God is that God is so big and God is so holy. God is so busy that he doesn't care or have time for my life. Sometimes we often think that um, it's not that this story is too good to be true or that it's not a good story. We often think that maybe just because we know our own story, that somehow we're not good enough. And here's what I want you to understand this Christmas. This Christmas tells us that God is not forgot and that God has come near, that God loves you deeply with everything that he is. And he loves you so much that he chooses to be with. He stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. And our response is, will we make room? Will we choose to make room in a busy, crowded season? Will we choose to simply receive the gift that is Christmas? John 3.16 in the Passion Translation says, For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him, they would never perish, but they would have everlasting life. Jesus has come to offer us life greater than the one that we live now. And my hope for you this Christmas is that we would take him up on his offer. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the people in this room. God, thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our hearts. God, thank you for Christmas. God, I pray that in this moment, Lord, that we would crowd out the noise, Lord, that we would sit in your presence, and that we would choose to make room. In Jesus' name.